Good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made, and we want to rejoice. We want to be glad in it. I'm delighted to be here with you this morning, and um, it was a bit cool this morning as you got out of your uh, home and headed out. It made me think of the word of the Lord when he says, you know, many are called, but a few are frozen, right? <laughs> so good to see some familiar faces here. You know, I have to give you a little bit of history. Um, I don't know how many years ago it was, but it was a long, long time ago, let's just say that, when several of us gathered at a storefront down in, where was that? Was it Eldersburg? Sykesville? Where was that storefront when we actually had our gathering? Do you remember? That was in the mall. Well, it was in the mall, that's right, exactly. A group of like-minded people came together one Sabbath afternoon. They all had their own churches that they were a part of, but they had a vision for a church in South Carroll. And uh, I was happy to be a part of that and to be from the Chesapeake Conference in those days and meet with that group as they strategized, as they laid plans, as they asked the Lord to help and guide them in their work. And I remember Herb was there, and Florence was there, and Estelle, I remember you were there. Um, Barbara, were you and Dick in that meeting? No. Okay. Huh? That, that one, okay. But uh, it was a great group, and I can't believe to see where it has all come to fruition today. God is good. Um, I've been able to watch your progress as a congregation from a distance. I remember the days when you were at a little church in Sykesville. How many of you were in that little church? Okay, quite a few of you, yeah. And then to see how God opened up this opportunity for you. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to see. That there is a light shining here in South Carroll. So, praise the Lord. Also, I think it would be very important for us to pause and just acknowledge anybody here who is a veteran, who has served in the military or our country. Would you stand, would you, whoever you are? Our veterans, please stand. And we have one in the back as well. Gentlemen, we want to say thank you for your service to this country. We owe you a debt of love. God bless you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the uh, Rodrigo for his music this morning. Wasn't that special? That wonderful ministry in music. Well, this morning, I want to ask a question as I get started. And I just want to ask, did anyone come to church this morning with an attitude? <laughs> One honest man. I know Sharon came to church with an attitude. Our deacons, would you take note of the ones who raised their hand, please? I might as well find out now. An attitude of gratitude. Good. I love that, Don. I asked the question this morning because the truth of the matter is that we all came to church this morning with an attitude. You see, the question isn't, did you come with an attitude? The question is, what kind of attitude did you come to church with today? Some of us woke up this morning and said, good Lord, it's morning. And others said, oh, good Lord, it's morning. What kind of attitude did you bring to church this morning? The attitude that you come to church with is probably just as important or maybe more important than what happens today at church. You can go to a church that has the best praise team. You can go to a church that has a dynamic, relevant speaker. You can go to a church where the people are warm and friendly. None of those things in themselves are enough. Because if you don't come to church with the right attitude, none of those things will really matter. What kind of attitude did you come to church today with? Or in fact, maybe the question I should ask is, are you in your right mind? Are you in your right mind? You see, it's not just the question that pertains to whether or not we get anything out of church, but it's a question as to whether we get anything out of life. 
The right attitude will focus on what we get out of life. And, you know, this is a reality that even Jesus faced in his ministry. Um, take a look at this passage here. Oops, there we go. I like in Mark chapter 6. It says that Jesus was in his own hometown or maybe his own home church. And there were people who were sick. There were people who were needy, people who needed a miracle. But Mark 6, 5 tells us that Jesus could not do any miracles there in Capernaum except to lay his hands on a few sick people and to heal them. Imagine for a moment going into his hometown village, people who needed a touch from God. But Jesus was unable to perform any miracles. His hands were tied. It, it wasn't because he was weak or unwilling. Rather, it was because, Scripture tells us, that they did not have faith. That they did not have the right mindset. They didn't have the right attitude that Jesus desperately wanted to do something for the people in his own hometown. But he wasn't able to. Because of their attitude, because of their lack of faith, because of the mindset that they had. Imagine the things that God might want to do in our lives. And I wonder if his hands are tied because we... I, you, we don't come with the right attitude. We don't have a heart that is open for what he wants to do. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about attitude. I want to talk to you a little bit about the importance of having the right mindset in our lives. To be mindful of our thinking and of our thoughts. And a principle I want to share with you is the principle that our Altitude is determined by our attitude. You see, your mindset, how you think, is the most important thing about you as a person. Your attitude in life is the single greatest determining factor of your happiness. Your out attitude is more important than your career, than the money that you have in the bank, than your education. Your altitude in life is largely determined by your attitude. And no surprise that we'll find that the Bible actually has a lot to say about our mindset and about our attitude and about the way that we think. Take a look at Proverbs 23. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And of course, when the Bible says, think in your heart, that's another word for in your mind. Okay? As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. You see, our life follows our thoughts. Let me repeat that. Your life follows your thoughts. You see, in the Christian life, the battle is for our mind. The mind is the battlefield. If we have a mind and an attitude that is thankful, that is optimistic, it tends to move us forward and upward. We tend to see the good in people. We have an optimistic outlook on life. We're positive. We see the possibilities. Whereas if we have a negative mindset, where we always see what is wrong, instead of seeing the possibilities, we see the problems. If we complain about the way things are, it tends to put us down. You ever met a person that you would say, oh, she has an attitude problem? Or he has an attitude problem. Our life follows our thoughts. What we believe defines us. That's exactly what this passage is telling us. What we believe, how we think, defines us. So let me ask you the question again. 
Are you in your right mind? What kind of attitude do you have? Our attitude, our beliefs, our thoughts determine our life. You and I are responsible for our attitude. You know, it's easy for us sometimes to think that, well, you know, I can't help the way I think. My parents were negative people. They were always critical. They were always finding what was wrong. I guess I just inherited that. I can't help it. Or you don't know the things going on in my life, preacher. If you knew the circumstances in my life, you'd understand why I tend to have a bad attitude. The fact of the matter is, attitude is a choice. Each one of us determine our attitudes. It's something that we can help. For the most part, it is our choice what kind of attitude we have. You know, one of the things I learned early in life is you can't always control what people call you or say about you, but you can determine how and what you respond to. It's a choice. You and I are bombarded each and every day with hundreds and thousands of information bits. You can't always control the information that's going to you, but which are you holding on to? Which are you allowing to stick? And not just the information that's coming from other people, but, you know, one of the biggest forces in our lives in helping us or hindering our attitude can be our own self-talk. This is something the Lord's been really wrestling with me here lately. Have you ever been mindful of your own self-talk? You know, they tell us, and I know it's a little scary you know, that you're talking to yourself. The fact of the matter is we all talk to ourselves. They tell us 1,200 words a minute. Self-talk. And that self-talk can either lift you up and make you encouraged and look forward to the day, or it can bring you down. What kind of self-talk is affecting your attitude? Attitude is not something that we're a victim of. Attitude is not something that you're, you inherit. Attitude is a choice. What kind of attitude are you choosing? They did a study in the University of Minnesota to determine how much control people really have when it comes to happiness and satisfaction in life. And in this study, they determined that there were three factors that affect each one of our lives, our attitudes. The first thing they said, when it comes to happiness and satisfaction in life, 40% of it's determined by genes. Genes. The stuff that you inherit. My father always had a bad attitude. I guess I'll have a bad attitude. I can't help it. I was born this way. 40% determined by genes. They say 10% of our happiness, our satisfaction, our mindset in life is determined by our circumstances. 10%. That people with good attitudes, well, in fact, let me say it this way. It's easy for us sometimes to think that our attitude is a result of our circumstances, but based on this research, only 10% of that is true. That people with good attitudes, their lives are not necessarily easier or better than yours or mine. It doesn't necessarily mean they have less problems that they're facing. In fact, there are some people out there who would, believe it or not, gladly trade places with you or with me. They would be glad to have that job that's stressing you out today. They would be glad to have that car that you're so tired of in driving. 
wives, women, they would be glad to put up with that husband of yours. And men, just in case you get up at Eve, remember there are men out there who are single who would love to have that wife of yours. People who would love the house that you live in that you complain about being too small. You see, attitude, 40% affected by genes, 10% of it's affected by circumstances, but the bulk of what our attitude is 50% our response to these things. Our response to these things. We can have an, a good attitude if we choose to have a good attitude. I think this is what Paul was trying to say here in Philippians 4. Notice he said in our scripture reading this morning, Jan read to us, Whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, respectable, if there be any what? Good. Think on these things. You see, Paul understood if there was ever a man who had a tough life, Look at the life of Paul, but Paul determined to think on these things. He realized his attitude was his choice. That he couldn't blame it as on heredity. He didn't blame it on his circumstances. If there be any good, think on these things. It's a choice. I like what Colossians says. Paul says, set your mind... And keep focused habitually on the things above. That sounds like a choice to me, folks. It sounds like a choice. It sounds to me like as Christians, we need to be mindful of our mindset. That we need to be intentional. We need to be deliberate about our mind and our thoughts. That we can't just accept passively the default where our mind might be. You see, we have to remember that we inherited a sinful mindset. And so if you just go with the flow, do you think it's going to be positive or do you think it's going to be negative? Our default is a broken, sinful default. Paul's telling us that we have to be intentional. We must train our minds Set your mind. Keep it focused habitually on things above. And then, I like what he says here in Philippians 4, 8. Oops, one more. I have learned to be content no matter what the circumstance. And again, remember who's making this statement. This isn't someone born with a silver spoon in his mouth and had a really smooth and easy life. Everybody liked him, you know, no problems. Paul had more than his fair share of circumstances that would have easily entitled him to have a bad attitude. I've learned to be content, he says. So let me bring it back home to you folks. What kind of attitude do you have? What kind of self-talk, what kind of toxic beliefs and thoughts might be going around in your mind? Are you in your right mind? One of my favorite quotes is from a guy by the name of Viktor Frankl. He was in a concentration camp in Germany. He was a psychiatrist. He himself was one of the uh, people who were in the concentration camp. But he writes the book after the fact, and he did a lot of research on the people who seemed to be able to endure the concentration camp experience, the ones who were able to make it and the ones who were not able to make it. And he says, if you look at their circumstances, it was very similar. You know, they all experienced deprivation. They all experienced uh, want and neglect. They all experienced abuse at the hands of the guards. But some of them were able to make it and were able to hold out and be rescued. Most of them weren't. And he said, what was the critical difference between the ones who made it and the ones who couldn't make it? And in his research, he says, the last of human freedoms is to choose our attitude in any given circumstance. 
Dr. Viktor Frankl says the bottom line in that experience wasn't the circumstances, but rather their attitude, how they responded. That they were able to take away all of their freedoms, they were able to take all of their possessions, they were able to take all of their, basically, their, the decisions that they were able to make except for one. And they couldn't take away the individual's choice to choose their response to their environment. The power of attitude. We are all responsible for our attitude. We must choose every day what kind of mindset we're going to have. It's the first choice we make when we get out of bed in the morning. It reminds me a story about an elderly man who had a sandwich at lunch, and on that sandwich there was Limburger cheese. He didn't know it, but he got a piece, just a tiny little piece of that stinky cheese stuck in his mustache. All day long, wherever he went, and this place stinks. My car stinks. My work stinks. My wife stinks. Everywhere he went for the day, something stinks around here. Little did he realize what stank was him. He was the one that stank. It was right under his nose. And how true many of us make the same mistake on a daily basis. We find what's wrong with other people. We're critical. We're negative. There's nothing wrong with them. What's wrong with our own thinking, our own attitude, our own mindset? I like how one author calls it stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. Now, let me be clear of something this morning because there is in the faith community a popular theory that says, you know, if you have a positive attitude about life, that only good things are going to happen to you. That you'll get that job promotion if you have the right attitude. You'll be able to save your marriage. You'll be healed of cancer. You just have to be positive. You just have to have the right mindset. That's not what I'm saying this morning, and that's not what the Bible says either. There are certain things that an attitude will not affect. First of all, your, an attitude is not going to be able to change your genes. An attitude will not change your genes. An attitude also will not change entirely your circumstances. You see, when Scripture tells us to choose our mindset, when Scripture teaches us to, that attitude is affected every area of our life, that we must choose our attitude. It's not that we're going to change these things, but we can change our response to these things. You may have gotten the low end of the gene pool. No matter what kind of attitude you have, it probably isn't going to change your genes, okay? But your attitude can change the way you respond to those genes. The sickness, the illness, the problems that come along with it. Same thing with your circumstances. One of the things you learn fast in life is life is not fair. You can't control all of the circumstances that affect you on a daily basis. You know, sometimes we make bad choices ourselves and we reap what we sow, right? But there are many, many things in life that happen to us that we didn't choose. We didn't have any say-so about and just because you have a good attitude doesn't mean you're going to change those circumstances. Maybe sometimes. But more important than changing the circumstance is to change our response to that circumstance. You see, God's workshop isn't to change your life. God's workshop is to change our heart. Now, there are times when he may change your circumstance in life. Thank you, Jesus. But his biggest concern is to change how we respond to our circumstances. 
So I just want to make that sure you have that distinction in your mind this morning. It reminds me of a story. I love this humorous story about a little boy who had a bat and who had a ball, and he had been learning about the power of positive thinking. And he would throw that ball up in the air, and he said, I'm going to be the best hitter in the world. And he would swing that bat, and he missed the ball. And he would say it again. I am the best hitter in the world. And he would throw the ball up in the air, and he would swing the bat, and he would miss the ball. And so he closed his eyes, and he really focused, and he really concentrated, and he envisioned himself. Oh, I see myself swinging that bat and hitting that ball, and it's going all over the field. And so one more time, I am a great hitter. I'm going to be able to hit that ball. And he throws the ball up in the air, and he swings, and he missed it. And he said, wow, I'm the greatest picture in the world. <laughs> Didn't change his circumstance, did it? But it did change his response to his circumstances. And that's what Paul, that's what the scriptures are trying to teach us this morning, is the importance of the mind when it comes to how we choose and how we face life. Now, the Bible bears this out in two very powerful case studies I want to share with you this morning as we come in for closing here. There's two very powerful case studies I want to share with you. Because you could say, well, you know, this whole attitude, this mindset stuff, you know, how does, what does it mean practically? But I want to share with you two examples in Scripture that I think that really powerfully bears out how your mindset, how your attitude dramatically impacts your life. The first thing I want to share with you is taken from Philippians chapter 2. And this is a, a familiar Scripture to you, I'm sure. Philippians 2, it says, Let this what? Let this mind, okay? So we're talking about mindset here. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, what form was he? Of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. His mindset, he was equal with God. Now remember, Jesus is our example in all things. Look, let's take a look at the mindset that Jesus had. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? says that he was equal with God. I think it's important that we remember who he was if we're going to really appreciate his mindset. Jesus was God. Amen? He wasn't God's junior partner. He wasn't the vice president of heaven. He was equal with God. He had the same divine nature, the same power that God had. Now catch his attitude, his mindset. You and I work so hard to make a name for ourselves. We are very concerned about our reputations. We spend a lot of energy on our images. We work hard to get that corner office and that executive floor. Jesus Christ, in the form of God, had all of that. He had all the fame, he had all the status, he had all the reputation. Notice his mindset. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? A servant. And was made in the likeness of man. He was in the form of God. He was equal with God. He had all the trappings, all the status, all the image, all the reputation. All the things that most people work all their lives to attain. He made himself of no reputation. He let go of it all. Wow, what a mindset. What an attitude. And not only did he let go of all these things, but it says he became in the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, what? Unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Jesus Christ, Son of God, coexistent with God, equal with God, King of kings, Lord of lords, angels worship Him, every knee bows down to Him. What was His mindset? He became a servant. He humbled himself. Folks, when was the last time you heard of rich and powerful people surrendering their rights? But that's exactly what Jesus did. Wow, what an attitude. He took on the likeness of men. He who knew no limits, think about that. God has no limits. He limited himself. He accepted the limitations of human flesh. And then not only did he do all that, but he died for sins that he never committed. He died abandoned by man and forsaken by God. Now let me tell you folks, that's an attitude. Wow, what an attitude. What a mindset. What a way to think. Now contrast this example, the mind of Christ, with another example. An example that we find, actually, if we have to give a label to Christ's mindset, I would say his, li- his mindset would be one of selfless love. Selfless love. Now take an example here, a story that we find in Isaiah. Another character study. Isaiah chapter 14, a particular angel in the garden. One who was second in command. One who was known for his beauty and one for his power, the Bible calls him Lucifer. Notice the mindset that we're going to find with this character. It says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground for you who have weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, where did he say it? In your heart, this is the mindset of Lucifer. This is how he thought. This was his attitude. I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. In contrast to Jesus... And his mindset, who was in the form of God, who was equal with God, who had all the things that people strive after, and who willfully let them go. We find the mindset of Lucifer is trying to get and crawl and claw and ascend his way to the top. Taking down whoever he has to take down to get there. I, 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 I will ascend, I will exalt. If Jesus' mindset, if his attitude was one of selfless love, then we would have to say Lucifer's mindset was self-love. Wow, what an attitude. Wow, what a way to think. Are you in your right mind this morning? Can you imagine and get a small glimpse of the difference it makes, the attitude that we have? And let me remind you, we're told to have the mind of Jesus. Let this mind be in you. What does that mean? That means that we think like Jesus thinks. That his thoughts are our thoughts. That we see people and we see ourselves from his point of view. The mind of Christ. His priorities become our priorities. What he thinks is valuable, we think is valuable. We live life from his perspective. That's what it means to have the mind of Christ. The very thinking of Jesus can be our thinking. But that doesn't come naturally. Remember I said our default thinking is sinful. It's broken. It came with the fall of this planet. 
And that's why we're told in Romans 2, don't conform to the world, it's thinking, but allow the Spirit to transform your minds. So brothers and sisters, I just want to close this morning with a challenge. Are you in your right mind? Is your mindset and your attitude one of selfless love? Or would it be better characterized as self-love? Our privilege in this life is to allow the Holy Spirit day by day, moment by moment, to transform our minds, to change our stinking thinking to the mind of Christ. Think about that. What a glorious privilege to actually be able to think the thoughts of Christ, to think the way he thinks. I just challenge you today, as a church, are you reflecting the mind of Christ? in your priorities, where you put your money, and what you do as a church. I challenge you individuals, are you reflecting the mind of Christ? Can you imagine the difference it would make in our homes? Can you imagine the difference it would make in our marriages? Can you imagine the difference it would make in our communities, our relationships, if we truly had the mind of Christ? May God bless us. May God transform us. May we be so connected with him and walk so closely with him that his mind and his thoughts become our thoughts. Wow, what an attitude.